In 1947, Israel declared its establishment, but on the second day of its existence, it faced an imminent threat to its existence. The entire Arab world rose up in an attempt to eliminate Israel, leading to seven major conflicts within just 40 years. Israel's third conflict with the surrounding Arab countries marked a relatively peaceful period in the Middle East. However, with a recent surprise attack on Israel by Hamas, the Middle East has once again plunged into conflict. Now, it is a moment for all Arab and Islamic forces to unite in an attempt to end Israel's occupation. It is the time to unite all the Arab and Islamic powers to overthrow the Israeli occupation. While Hamas has initiated acts of terrorism, Global support for the Palestinian people has not waned, but rather increased. The question remains, why did Israel incur the enmity of the Arab world from the very beginning, with the Palestinian cause being embraced by the entire Arab world? How did the Palestinian people gradually lose their leverage and become enduring refugees? The Holy Land is soaked in blood, and the Jewish people will not continue to endure. Whose responsibility is it now? The most severe deficiency is hope. If this is your first time tuning into our channel, the primary focus here is to provide critical perspectives on historical or societal controversial events, offering insightful descriptions and commentary. If you're interested, please consider subscribing to our channel and turning on the notification bell. Let's get started. Today, let's explore why Palestinians believe that this land, along with Israel, should belong to them. Over the past few decades, how have they attempted to reclaim lost territory? And is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict seemingly unresolvable? To understand why Israel faced hostility from its neighbors the moment it was established, we first need to clarify the roots of the Palestinian people. Just before the establishment of Israel, this land was known as Palestine. When did the ancestors of the Palestinian people begin to establish a significant presence in this region? The story begins in the year 70 AD when the Jewish people were defeated by Roman forces twice and subsequently faced widespread exile. Fast forward five centuries, the Arab people initiated a series of Islamic conquests, expanding from the Arabian Peninsula into the Middle East, North Africa, and other regions, including Palestine, which was under the control of the Byzantine Empire. As a result of these conquests, many Arab newcomers settled in the region, and it came under Arab rule for about 900 years. Subsequently, over the following centuries, there were two transfers of power in Palestine, ultimately falling under the rule of the Ottoman Empire. However, these changes in governance primarily affected the top administrative layer and had a relatively minor impact on the local population, with the majority of the inhabitants being Arabs and only a small Jewish minority, constituting 5 to 10 percent of the population. So, if we do the math, Arab people had been living in Palestine for over a thousand years. The population dynamics began to change dramatically after World War I, when the Ottoman Empire disintegrated and the British assumed control of Palestine. This was a crucial moment as the population composition started to shift. Why did this happen? During World War I, the British had initially promised the Arab people the establishment of an Arab state. But unexpectedly, they also pledged to support the return of the Jewish people to their homeland and the establishment of a Jewish state, facilitating the immigration of a large number of Jewish settlers. This caused discontent among many Arab residents, and tensions escalated between the two communities. In 1947, the United Nations proposed the Partition Plan for Palestine, which aimed to divide the land, with one part given to the Jewish people for the establishment of Israel and the other part allocated for the Arab people which was meant to become Palestine. After the United Nations approved the partition plan for Palestine, the Jewish community accepted it as a good deal, while the Palestinian people, along with the broader Arab nation, strongly rejected it. They believed that the Jewish people, as newcomers, were taking over their land and refused to accept any land division plan. So in 1948, when the British flag was lowered and the Israeli flag was raised, it marked the official detonation of the ticking time bomb in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Arab countries vehemently opposed the partition plan and called for a holy war against the Jewish people. One side declared statehood, while the other launched a holy war. Since the surrounding countries and the Palestinians themselves were Arab, and many had earlier dreams of a unified Arab nation, Israel became a source of animosity. The Arab goal was to eliminate Israel, and they mocked the idea of a Jewish state rising to power. The entire Arab League immediately prepared to support the Palestinian people, who were, in this context, the Arabs living in the region before the 1947 partition. The Secretary General of the Arab League even claimed it would be a war of extermination, a major massacre. The leader of the Muslim Brotherhood said that all Arab people would rise up and annihilate the Jewish people, filling the sea with their bodies. Their aim was to destroy Israel, restore Palestine, and reunify the Arab nation. In that time, the Arab perspective on their adversary, the newly established Israel, 
was shaped by several factors. Geographically, Israel was seen as a small and strategically shallow nation, with no significant buffer zone to absorb the attacks coming from all directions in the Arab world. Israel found itself surrounded on three sides, with challenges from the north, facing Syria and Lebanon, the east, where it had to resist the Iraqi military, to the west, contending with the Jordanian Arab Legion, and in the south, defending against the powerful Egyptian forces, the entire Arab nation seemed poised to dismantle Israel. Furthermore, the Arab world's population was significantly larger, with approximately 40 million people living in the five neighboring Arab countries, while Israel had only about 600,000 inhabitants. It was closer to one against six to seven people, making it an extremely challenging situation. To put it bluntly, even one person spitting would drown them. In terms of the military, Israel had not yet established a regular army. Its forces were composed of male and female fighters, including high school students. The primary victims of Arab attacks were civilians. During that time, the Arab forces were indeed formidable, consisting of well-trained, well-equipped soldiers with British and French weapons. The Jordanian army, in particular, was known for its exceptional leadership, extensive combat experience, and strength. Palestinian people believed they had the full support of the entire Arab nation and were determined to assert their sovereignty in their territory, even if it meant defeating the Jewish population. Even the Egyptian leadership was confident and boasted that there wouldn't be a real war. At most, it would be a military exercise. They claimed they would take Tel Aviv within two weeks. Reportedly, they didn't even have a map of Palestine, demonstrating their lack of serious planning for the war. This arrogance foreshadowed their shocking losses as the conflict unfolded. Israel, facing an existential threat right from its inception, may have had a smaller population, but it had a swift response to the crisis. One of the most crucial outcomes of this dire situation was the unification of all of Israel's military forces into a professional army called the Israel Defense Forces IDF. This force was composed of independent Jewish militia members and valuable volunteers, some of whom had prior experience with the Royal Air Force. From the beginning, the IDF displayed exceptional organization and command, with many members having direct experience in World War II, including both training and combat experience. For the Jewish people who had suffered the Holocaust at the hands of the Nazi regime, this was not just a battle for a dream, but a fight for survival. Consequently, there was a unified national effort with high efficiency. The Egyptian military suffered significant losses, and its Palestinian bases were isolated. Many soldiers were taken as prisoners. In contrast, the Arab countries, despite their larger populations, were divided and had different ambitions. Some sought to unify the Arab world under their leadership, others were driven by pure nationalism, and some aimed to annex Palestinian territories. Political and strategic differences led to a lack of coordination and unified command, resulting in disjointed and uncoordinated attacks. The Haganah forces, victorious in this situation, expelled Arabs from the city and took many prisoners. Of course, there were many other factors at play. For example, Israel received material support from its allies and had the advantage of defending its home turf. Israel successfully weathered its first internal crisis while the Arab states suffered a humiliating defeat. Arab nations called for an emergency United Nations meeting, which ultimately resulted in a resounding victory for Israel. The conflict that lasted for 10 months led to significant changes in the map of Palestinian territories. When the ceasefire was declared, the West Bank and East Jerusalem fell under Jordanian control, while the Gaza Strip came under Egyptian administration. Israelis often refer to this conflict as the War of Independence, but for the Palestinian Arabs, it is known as Nakba, which means catastrophe. When assigning blame, it's important to note that launching a war and then trying to evade responsibility doesn't absolve any party. During the war, more than 400 Palestinian villages were destroyed, and many residents were displaced. The responsibility for this refugee crisis primarily fell on the Arab governments. Between 1947 and 1949, an estimated 700,000 Palestinians became instant refugees, dispersing to neighboring countries and residing in various United Nations built refugee camps. Many of them found refuge in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Today, many Palestinians still hold the keys to their homes from that period, even though many of those homes no longer exist. The topic of how long it took for them to return remains unresolved to this day. This war would not be the last between Israel and the Arab states. After weeks of a standoff, the Suez Crisis came to the forefront as a major news event. With Israel invading Egypt, Britain and France declared the Suez Canal to be in danger. Over the decades following the conflict, there were other wars between the two sides. In 1956, the Suez Crisis occurred, followed by the Six-Day War in 1967, in which the Arab world suffered a decisive defeat at the hands of the Israeli military. Israel gained control of the Gaza Strip and the Sinai Peninsula from Egypt, the West Bank and East Jerusalem from Jordan. 
and the strategically significant Golan Heights from Syria. The Six-Day War was a pivotal conflict, and if you're interested, we can create a separate episode to delve into its details. In 1973, the Yom Kippur War took place, resulting in no major territorial changes. The casualties on both sides were high, but Arab nations bore the brunt of the losses. Egypt, which once aimed to unite the Arab world, had by then stopped discussing it. In the past, the Palestinians were focused on reclaiming their former territories, but now, many of them are directly occupied by the Israelis. They had hoped to rely on the help of their Arab neighbors, but Egypt, as a regional power, surprised many by secretly negotiating with Israel and allowing them to exchange land for recognition. The Palestine Liberation Organization, which had been in conflict with Israel for decades, including engaging in terrorist attacks, was also a significant player. In the later stages of the conflict, the Palestine Liberation Organization expressed a willingness to accept a two-state solution with Israel, coexistence, and signed a historic agreement with Israel. However, during years of negotiations, a significant change occurred in the West Bank, which was occupied by Israel. Israel was responsible for governing the Palestinian population, with whom they had been in conflict for decades. As a result, the West Bank began to be gradually absorbed by Israel. Many Jewish people, for various reasons, moved to the theoretically temporarily occupied areas, including for religious purposes, to assert Israeli sovereignty, or simply because it was more affordable. Later, the government supported their settlement, funded infrastructure, and provided security. These settlements developed into communities, including hospitals and schools. However, in some cases, Palestinian homes were demolished to make way for these Jewish communities. The acquisition of Palestinian homes by Jewish settlers often led to tensions and disputes. Palestinians argued that the land did not belong to the settlers and protested against the construction of these communities. The international community also condemned these settlements, and the United Nations passed resolutions declaring them illegal. Israel's response was that technically, it was not an occupation. They claimed that the area was not an independent territory before they took control, and it was, at most, a disputed region. They largely ignored international criticism and continued to expand the settlements. The long-standing Palestinian grievances that had built up over the years eventually erupted in the late 1980s when the first Intifada, a Palestinian uprising, began. Around 500,000 Palestinians took to the streets, demanding an end to the Israeli occupation. The Israeli military responded with force, leading to nearly 2,000 casualties. This protracted conflict led both Israel and the Palestine Liberation Organization to realize that the situation could not continue. Finally, they attempted to sit down for negotiations, laying the groundwork for Palestinian autonomy. They reached the Oslo Accords, an agreement that paved the way for the two-state solution and mutual recognition between Israel and the Palestinians. This agreement was aimed at assisting the Palestinians in gradually progressing toward the goal of establishing an independent state. This may sound like a glimmer of hope after years of conflict in the Middle East. However, the historic agreement faced significant opposition at the time, both from Israelis and Palestinians. Jewish people wondered why they should give up parts of the West Bank and recognize the Palestine Liberation Organization, which they viewed as a terrorist organization. Palestinians had their reasons for opposing the agreement as well. The Oslo Accords divided the West Bank into three areas, A, B, and C. Area A was under Palestinian self-administration. Area B was jointly managed by both Israelis and Palestinians, and Area C was controlled by Israel. However, it's essential to note that Israel retained control over about 60% of the West Bank, including the most fertile land. The Israeli military was responsible for overall security in the entire region. The Oslo Accords were intended as a first step toward reconciliation, but they did not address thorny issues such as Jerusalem, and remained unresolved. Simultaneously, Jewish communities in the West Bank continued to expand. Palestinians observed these developments with growing frustration, as their land was fragmented, and the best areas were being taken over by Israeli settlements. They felt their ability to establish a viable state, build schools, and hospitals was being undermined. The situation led to further mistrust. Ultimately, the Second Intifada, or Palestinian uprising, erupted. This time, it was even bloodier and involved numerous acts of terrorism. Radical groups like Hamas gained influence, and suicide bombings targeting Israeli civilians increased. The death toll in the Second Intifada exceeded 4,300 people, with Palestinians suffering more casualties than Israelis. This period led many Israelis to question the feasibility of coexistence with Palestinians. Israeli politics shifted to the right, with an increasing number of security measures such as walls and checkpoints. Israel controlled and monitored the movements of Palestinians to ensure the safety of its own citizens. On the other side, in 2005, Israel withdrew from Gaza, but it soon fell under the control of Hamas, 
a group that aims to destroy Israel, Gaza has been subjected to blockades by both Israel and Egypt due to their dislike for Hamas resulting in a stagnant economy and a severe humanitarian crisis. As a result, many Palestinians born in Gaza are effectively trapped in the territory. This is a broad outline of the Palestinian narrative and their history in this region. They went from desiring to destroy Israel to being under the influence of others, to reluctantly accepting a two-state solution, and to now losing even the meager bargaining chips in negotiations. They now helplessly witness more Arab countries breaking the ice and normalizing relations with Israel. At this stage, the Palestinian people have been divided into various factions. Some remain hardliners, insisting on using violence to reclaim their lost land, while others are simply seeking peaceful coexistence. Many Palestinians have suffered personal losses, such as losing fathers, brothers, uncles, and cousins, including extended family members. Hence, when events like Hamas attacks occur, they may not universally condemn these actions, but it doesn't imply that every Palestinian civilian endorses such attacks. The difficulty in the peace talks lies in finding a single, independent institution that can genuinely represent the entire Palestinian nation in negotiations. Many scholars believe that the Palestinian issue can't be resolved overnight, and the conflicts in the Middle East are inherently challenging to untangle. When making these documentaries, it's crucial to note that listening doesn't necessarily mean endorsing. Understanding why terrorists emerge doesn't equate to supporting terrorist attacks. Just like a doctor understands pathogens, it doesn't mean they like diseases. When a thief steals, it's often due to poverty, but that doesn't mean they have a passion for theft. As an unconventional critic, we need to understand that deepening our knowledge doesn't equate to deepening our approval. In a chaotic world, it becomes even more crucial to listen to what each party has to say, and more importantly, what they haven't said. Food for thought. Do you think a resolution to the Israel-Palestine conflict is possible? If you want to continue supporting this channel, remember to like, comment, subscribe, and click the notification bell to ensure you don't miss any episodes. Lastly, if being radical is the new norm and objectivity is considered heretical, Perhaps we should be radically objective. Until next time, stay curious and stay unconventional.